Hi there and welcome to the quick and dirty guide on how to stop losing to the AI. Alright, there are 25 points. I'm going to try and cover this in this video and I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet and hit all the points as nicely as I can with quick little guides here and there. The first thing you want to do when you're on a losing streak, you got to choose the right players for the matches. Make sure they've got determination and work rate. These are the players that are going to be in your support duties and these are the players you're going to depend on when the, the, uh, the shit hits the fan. You also want to check the reputation of each and every club you're facing. The higher the reputation of the club, the more likely they're going to be attacking towards you. And chances are, they might try different things in the game. So you have to have a plan A and a plan B, which brings us to my next point. Your system needs to have options. If you're going to go out there with a 4-2-3-1, think about how you can make that system a bit more defensive. You don't have to change the tactic. You may just need to change roles, duties, mentality. That's about it. I mean, just think about different ways in which you can make it solid. Furthermore, the best time to actually do all this is in preseason. You've got eight games in preseason to try all kinds of wonderful things. Now, a lot of people tend to skip preseason. I, on the other hand, enjoy preseason a lot because that's when I go really groovy and I try ridiculous things with my tactics. I've even used one defender in one of my preseason matches just to see if I could get away with it. So it's really important that you use these opportunities to set the team right and use this because squad management is actually one of the more important reasons why people get into a bad rut. And the best way to uh, solve that is actually just focusing on the basics. So if you've got a team, get a nice view going and look across your team and see who are the players who have got determination and work rate. That's really easy to do. Then these are the players that you depend on because every single tactic requires you to have some support duties, right? So these are the guys that are going to go up and come down. And whenever you change shape, these are the ones that you're depending on to do the job well. So a, pers a player with great determination shows he's got desire. A player who's got good work rate shows that he's willing to work hard. And this is a beautiful combination. Now, whenever things go wrong, the first player you want to look out for are those players who have low determination or who, who have low work rate because this influences the rest of their, the way they play. So if you have a player who's got low determination, low work rate, what you want to do is you always want to make a note of where he's playing on the pitch. If he's really white, vital to your system, make sure that he's got players around him who can pick up the slack. Because you're gonna you're gonna notice in games sometimes players uh, you know I see managers complain oh this guy you know we we're getting overrun the left flank and then the easiest way for you to find out is was there a player that that didn't want to pick up the slack and if that is the case then this is the player you're gonna be watching out for and it's not that hard to do so once you go into your system be it a four two three one or four one four one any tactic it does not matter just look out for the attributes, determination, and work rate. These are important. Bravery is also an important attribute in my, from my point of view. Because support players, if you expect the support players to come in and tackle, right? you want them to put in a challenge, then they need to be brave enough to put in a challenge. They need to be willing to get hurt. So you're going to, if you want them to play that role and you expect them to come back and defend, then have some bravery because if otherwise they're just going to pull out of a challenge they might be great as door stoppers they're not but they're not going to stop the door from slamming shut in the other players faces so you want to make sure that these players have the right attributes so yes whenever you have a bad run go through your team identify those players and make sure you put the right 11 on the pitch now this brings me to my next point because once you've got these 11 players in your side use preseason it gives you a great opportunity to find out how you can play your tactic differently here we have a 4132 it's got a wing back on attack and a dlp on support my spine is actually the three support players you see in midfield now these are the players i expect to see coming back really quickly so i want to make sure that these three players have got determination work rate and bravery then i will look all at all the other attributes like Okay, do they have acceleration? Do, okay, if they don't have great mentals, and I'm thinking, hmm, maybe they can make it up with great acceleration. Maybe they can, you know, they, they, they may not have anticipated the ball, but they're willing to get back quickly with, uh, qu as quickly as they can. Now, then you look at their technicals. Always look at, uh, this is my way of playing. I always look at mentals, then I look at physicals, and finally technicals. Technicals are things like tackling and marking, which honestly to me, I've played DLPs with tackling of 10, and they still do a fantastic job. So make sure that you choose your players, and this 
has to give you the ability to make options in the game. Now, a 4-1-3-2 can be played many, many ways. It can be played um, very simply the way it's like you see on the screen with a lopsided attack, which has got a wing back bombing down the flanks. Now, in some games, some games you might think to yourself, okay, you know, it might be a bit too risky. What can I do? Then you've got other options. If you notice, I've got wing back on defend too, so I can lock him down. I also have a DLP on support. Now, that DLP on support can be changed to a DLP on defend, or he can even be pushed into a register, but I'll never ever put him in, never ever use him as an anchor man, because in this particular case, I don't want him to be an anchor. An anchor does nothing. So, apart from just standing in front of the two central defenders. So I'd rather have him, you know, crunching tackles, providing a really good screen. And then on the right flank, with the wing back on attack, he bombs down the flanks. So this is one option. Let's say the game changes and I decide, hmm, I need to lock things down. What can I do? I can turn the wing back on attack to a wing back on support. I can turn the DLP on support to a DLP on defend. Of course, a wing back on defend can stay as a wing back on defend. But these are some of the options that I can take. What if I wanted to attack? Then I just change the uh, duties of the players. Similarly, I can use shouts as well because you've got to be very careful about the way you use shouts. So when you're looking at your system, you've got to think about permutations. Your system, that 4132 or any of your other systems, always have options. You just need to identify the options. Learn what the different roles do. And then understand what attributes are needed for those roles to really kick off. I've covered these in many, many guides, but for the purposes of this video, there's just too much information to go through. And I'll just go on to the next point. Whenever you're on a great run, sometimes you get into a complacency. Great teams have done that. I mean, I remember the World Cup, right? Brazil going into the final, red hot favorites. Just get slapped around by Germany 7 1. And um, I won't forget that. Was it 7 1? I think it was a big scoreline like that. But these are the things that happen in games when you assume things, right? So never assume things are going to go right. Never assume things are going to go your way. Always have a have always have a plan A and a plan B. It does not mean you need to have a different tactic all the time. It just means that you need to think of your formation and whether or not it gives it gives you options. Any system can play offensively and defensively. That's why we have the mentality and team shape and team instructions. So plan the use of your shouts. Now there are people out there that don't think about it, they, they download a tactic, but that's perfectly okay. If you if you don't understand tactics, it's perfectly okay to go and download somebody else's tactic. Now, when you download somebody else's tactic, you got to look at the tactic and try and understand why the play, you know, the guy who created those tactics may have stuck in all these PIs and TIs. You need to know why, because it has implications for how the system is going to play out. So when you, when you want to play the game, Always understand the shouts because they are offensive shouts, they are defensive shouts. They are shouts that help you keep possession of the ball and they are shouts that make you lose possession of the ball. High risk shouts like pass into space, defensive line changes, these are all high risk shouts. Even raising of the tempo can be a high risk shot. So whenever you want to use any of these three shouts, think very carefully about whether you really need to use those shouts. Shouts like retain possession, work ball into box, and a re uh, roam from position are great little shouts to combine together for you to get different kind of things going on. Like sometimes when I want to hold on to the ball or close out a game, I tend to go on a lower mentality and sometimes I'll just go tell my players to retain possession and roam from positions. Because roaming from position doesn't mean they're going to play like headless chickens. It just means they make themselves more available for the pass. Uh, retain possession just tells my team, hey, guys, let's not try any through passes right now, okay? Everybody just make sure you pass the ball to somebody's feet. That's what retain possession does. Work ball into box. Yeah, this one, you got to think about it as well. Work ball into box reduces crosses, right? So if, when you get into the opponent's third, suddenly your team slows a bit down and it starts by tick-tocking the ball around the box. Now, it may be a ideal, ideal in certain cases. Make sure your players have decent composure. So sometimes people use the work ball into box and complain, oh man, I keep losing the ball. Why would that happen? Because your players don't have good first touch and composure. They're not, you know, they're not built to play that kind of a game. So don't play work ball into box. Just go retain possession, roll for positions, get them to pass the ball to each other and waste time. Because that's another way you can keep hold of the ball and generate high possession numbers. So whenever you go into a game and you're losing and you want to get out of a losing run, the first thing you do is look at your shots and go, which of these shots are high risk? 
pass into space is one. Another one, their defensive line shot. The third one, oh yes, look for overlap shot. Look for overlap. I have talked about it. it increases mentality, makes the person get further forward. When he does get further forward, on a transition, he might not be in position. And in this video, I'll give you a very good example of even when they don't have a look for overlap shot, that can be a bad thing too. So you need to be very careful when you're creating the system. What we're going to do now is go and take a look at what we need to do for pre-match preparations. Whenever... I'm on a lose whenever I'm on a bad losing run, I always want to make sure that I check the team that I'm playing against. That's the first rule of thumb. Are they expecting to beat the crap out of me? Or am I expecting to have an easy ride? And chances are if I'm on a losing run, every match is gonna be a tough match. So I plan to play defensively, mentally. I'm already telling myself, okay, fine, I'm gonna go into this match and I'm gonna watch how I play. I'm not gonna lose possession of the ball. I'm just gonna suss this team out. And this is where their reputation is important. I need to and, you know, I need to ascertain how much of a threat are they going to be. If it's a, and I use that the uh, season preview guy to give me a good clue. Here we're playing as Ajax, and I've got Utrecht in my next match, ninety-five to one. I already know. Okay, fine, Utrecht. Well, this is going to be a fifty-fifty game. This is going to be a tough team that we are playing against, and they could, they could spring a surprise if I'm not careful. And we are traveling away, so chances are they are definitely not going to sit back because. They're not very far away from us in odds. If it was a Sparta at the bottom of the table, I can expect them to be camping. But Utrecht, well, this could be a tough match. So I have to be mentally prepared for the match. And I then look at the scout reports because the scout reports will give me a good clue. And Utrecht are not playing a very basic system. They're playing something like a 5-3-2. And their focus of attacks is totally central. So it's going to run against my system because I'm playing a narrow 4-1-3-2 myself. And if this is the case, then I have to come up with a plan A and a plan B. This is when I start looking at my tactic and going, okay, fine. Um, if I, we're both pushing to the center, they have wing backs I have to be very careful of as well. And I've got to be watching out because if I'm going to launch my wing backs into a tank, I might leave myself open. But it's a chance I might be willing to take early in the game. So this is where planning a strategy comes in. I have a strategy. I'm going to come down the right flank. I know that uh, one of my players may not be too good at the back. Um, so I brought in Westermount. And he's going to be playing as one of the central defenders. He's, he might be a bit slower, but he's very intelligent. And we're looking at the situation and we've already determined that we might need to push uh, Klaassen from the middle and try and tell him to punch through so that we can put some pressure on their attack that's coming from the middle. So that's my strategy, a very planned strategy. And I'm going to use shouts like retain possession, work ball into box, play in, uh, roam from position just to hold on to the ball. Now, higher tempo is a bit of a risky thing. I might take that off during the game, but... My whole goal here is to start the game slow and assess how much of a threat they're going to be down the flanks. I want to also see whether I can keep possession of the ball and do something with it. Okay, what about what about team talks? What do I do about team talks? Well, I'm going to assign them to my ass man. But for those of you who are micromanagers who would love to use team talks, sometimes I do too. <laughs> then just be assertive. If you're a goal up, tell them to play better. If they're, if they're two goals up, tell them to sh shut up. Don't say anything. If they're three goals up, maybe pat them on the back. If there's one all and expect to win, kick them and give them a kick up the ass and be aggressive. That's it. That's all there is to team talks, okay? No rocket. <laughs> there's no rocket science here. Otherwise, you give it to your ass, man. When it comes to body language, it becomes really challenging because uh, here in this particular game you're playing, uh, if you look at Davy Klaassen, he seems aggressive, right? Uh, this is what the body language says. And then if I'm looking at his attributes, aggression is 18, which to me would seem perfectly understandable that he seems aggressive because that's the kind of guy he is. But um, some people swear by body language. I know it helps because... Um, this this and other features were introduced into the game to make it easier for people to see things happening. But for me, um, I don't want to stare at it for too long. So if you are going to be the sort that uses body language, then you, what you can do is you can combine body language with... Uh, with uh, not team instructions, rather with team talks. So you can go to David Klaassen and give him a touchline team talk and tell him to be to calm down. This is this is one of the ways you can use it. Uh, I personally uh, feel that it's uh, it's a lot of information, but you should use it after the fact. Now, do I believe it's got a big impact? I don't know. I I I don't use it a lot. You see, the thing about me is I like to see things on the screen, and for me. 
if I see a player out of position or I see a player not coming up to support another player quickly enough, then I look at attributes first before I look at body language. But body language, I've only like used it out of 20 games, 30 games, maybe once or twice. So body language can be a good tool, but it's not something that I would swear upon. I know there are some people who swear on body language, okay? And i not one of those. I can... A, a really, really good player will probably not even need to use body language at all because uh, he'll be looking at the screen and going, hmm, is uh, look at the uh, look at the transitions. I'm looking at the positions everyone is taking. Okay, fine. This looks good. We're attacking very well. I don't think I need to look at body language because my players are playing well. Maybe body language in in one area. I think body language is probably really good. Warning you, a player who might get sent off. That I agree because uh, then you can use body language uh, here. Uh, we have a player who's very aggressive and I'm, my eyes are looking sharply at my captain because I, I'm worried about him. I do not want him being sent off. So uh, I use uh, team talks, which, uh, you know, they last for like about 15 to 20 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. The effect of it will last for that long on him. As long as he's grayed out, you know, he's under the influence of that team talk. Ooh. And it will work on... Uh, Enhancing some attributes in a game or um, diminishing others, I guess. So, uh, and this is something that as I have not really gone out and given you a straightforward guide on as what are the attributes that are being affected. So here, I would definitely be thinking about how to use uh, body language effectively. Now, if you're already the kind of player that doesn't need it, then fine. By all means, enjoy yourself. If you're the sort of person that is not too sure but just wants to combine something, then yeah, use it in conjunction with the attributes in your team to understand your players a bit more effectively. Here, we see the word seems aggressive. That's it. What about complacent? There are other body language like complacent, right? Now, uh, some players can't be bothered. I mean, you will use disinterested and complacent will pop up. So if those those pop up, then maybe you want to maybe you want to use. But I like I said before, you know, this is all purely conjecture. My point because I don't really see the need to use body language. I've hardly ever used it. And now we're gonna get into the match itself. Your style depends on your opponents. Really, that's it. Okay, how you play is dictated by your opponents, the kind of system your opponents are using. So what you want to do during the course of the match is you want to pay attention to how you're defending. Okay, look out for little mistakes that your team makes and then you want to look at how you move from defense to attack and how you move from attack to defense so or you're always aiming for what i call a smooth passage or a smooth transition working from the goal all the way to an attempt on goal so these are the kind of things that you want to be looking out for in your game so never ever get stuck into the notion that you shouldn't be changing your tactic because the ai is going to change its tactic the ai will change roles the ai is going to change duties the ai will change mentality the ai is going to change shape so why should you not adapt I mean, if your system is that good, then you shouldn't be on a losing run. So you shouldn't be watching this video. This is for all those people who are on a losing run and want to do something. So here, this is the part of the, the whole the whole match where you your job is how you manage your tactics. So it's very important to pay attention to those little transitions that happen in the game. And one of the things that I always tell people to do is choose the right highlights mode when you go into these kind of matches. So you want to watch the highlights mode on the right mode. I mean, if you choose to watch it on key highlights, then you're going to have no chances for making mistakes because the highlights just gonna come and go <laughs> okay if you're watching extended highlights maybe they'll give you like two or three chances before you go you need to make a change all right if you're watching on comprehensive highlights it's nice relaxing you might see too many highlights but you make sure that throughout these highlights modes that you pick if it's not showing your team in a tank then there's something wrong so whenever you see a highlights mode where things don't seem to be right, then you need to make a change. And this is very important. The highlights modes are the best clues. You also want to make sure that you're watching it with the right tools. So go and look at the action zones widget. Make sure it's on your screen. Make sure the formation widget is also on your screen. And make sure that you're paying attention to outlier ratings. What I mean by outlier ratings is really simple. Now, if you see a team and their ratings are like 7.5, you scored a goal. <laughs> 
which is nice. <laughs> okay, and you've got a few players scoring goals, and everyone's doing nice. Where you're leading two nil, everything is nice and dandy, and then you see one player who's got a rating of six point four. Six point four. Your whole team is doing well. There's one guy with 6.4. This is what I call an outlier rating. Something is wrong somewhere with this player. So either, if he's a striker, sometimes I just, no, I, I let it go. Maybe he's missed a penalty. Maybe he's given up a yellow card. Maybe he's, you know, he's uh, given up a, you know, I don't know, something really bad, okay? So the, the, the ones you can see, okay, fine. But what if, what if it's the ones you can't see? You don't know. I mean, oddly enough, it looks like he's getting a low rating. Keep your eyes on him. Check his determination, his work rate. Watch him during transitions like a hawk. This is what you need to do. Because that person could cost you the game. So what do I look out for in a game? Okay. And so far, I've been on key highlights. Nothing has happened. So I've gone to comprehensive. Comprehensive highlights. At this point, I'm looking at... They are attacking. So what I want to see? We're breaking up their transition. So they don't have a smooth passage. And that's exactly what we do. And at this point in time, we've broken their smooth passage up. I'm not going to see whether or not we can build play up. Have I got enough players in support for the ball? That, that looks pretty good. So these are the kinds of things that I'm looking at. When my goalkeeper has the ball, there's also another I, uh, I take a look at them as well because i want to see that the ball moves smoothly from my goalkeeper into an attempted goal and i'm i'm looking at this now we're, it's only the ninth minute i can afford to make some mistakes i can afford that so we are playing with retained possession we are playing with roam from positions we're playing for quite a lot of shots look notice how my wing back on attack bombs up so fast and that's when i'm thinking to myself hmm there's a there's a bit of a hmm in my voice and then i'm going Hey, but he wins the ball back. He he does bomb forward, gets back quickly into position. Not too bad. We don't look too bad. And now my players are running forward, they get shut out. But we can still win the second ball. So at this point, I'm not panicking because, okay, fine. Uh, we're looking okay in terms of possession. I At this point, I don't even know where possession numbers are because all I want to see is a transition smooth from the back all the way to the front. But here I notice already at this point in time, maybe we're tick-tocking the ball too many times. So what do I do? I take off the work ball into box shot. Of course, that doesn't lead to the goal. Uh, that's like a fluke. <laughs> but at this point, I'm still not convinced. So even though I have removed that shot, because the work ball into box, my players were, you know, the, this team you're playing at with, against, they managed to get all their players back in time. So by the time we tick-tock, 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 merrily tick-tock the ball there, you know, we couldn't create goal-scoring chances. Now, I'm looking at things like, okay, we've lost the ball. All right, Klaassen got onto the ball he, at this point. This is like another transition failure. But look at where my wing back is. Did you notice my wing back was so high up the pitch? And then when they played the ball over the top, I almost got caught out on the right flank. You see, this is something that a lot of people do. They go, they get very excited about their tactics and go, like, okay, fine, oh shit. But they don't spot that. That's what I spotted. So at halftime, what do I do? I don't really bother. My ass man is doing the talk. I'm looking at the formation. We are wing back on attack. They've changed formations to a 4 3 3, which will put more pressure on my wing back on attack. So at this point in time, I'm thinking to myself, okay, maybe I should do something else. Maybe I can try something different. So I go into my system. I change certain roles. I change my DLP to defend. And then I will change my wing back onto support as well. Because this is something that uh, we want to we want to move the ball ar around a lot more effectively, and as you can see, a small little change like that sometimes can have major major implications on how you play. So we managed to get the ball up very smoothly, as you can see. We, even we roll from positions, it doesn't do too much to your team. I mean, look at how we make ourselves available. This is what I'm looking at. This is what I call a smooth passage. We move the ball seamlessly from defense right into an attempt at goal. And this is what you need to look for in your games. Especially when you're losing. If you're losing and you find that you don't create these kind of seamless movements, then something is wrong somewhere and you need to make either a change in role, a change in duty, perhaps even a change in personnel. Because if your tactic is basic and it's solid, you shouldn't have issues. And as you can see, um, we're always looking for those kind of smooth transitions. Even a second ball from a goalkeeper, they are kicking the ball out. We pick it up. We tick-tock the ball along. We're not playing with a pushed-up defensive line. There's no pressure on my back line anymore. I've got a wing-back on support who's now 
no longer running off like a headless chicken. Okay, he's around. We are playing roam from positions and we still look pretty decent. No ball into box. We get the ball into the box and we score again. So these are some of the things that you can do in your game. You need to, when you are having a bad run, start spotting and looking out for smooth passages. When you don't have a smooth passage, you need to fix things. What do you fix? Roll, duty, um, taking a playoff. What we did in our game, we took a shout change off. We also changed the duty of the wing back. We dropped him from attack to support and that was all it was, all that was needed to tweak the system. In pre-season, what I do is I always abuse the hell out of these little stat zone stuff and here I'm looking at my our team and going to look at our heat map which shows a pretty good domination of the patch as well. Uh, and we, we control large areas of the pitch. And this is a good clue as to which areas of the pitch you are controlling. And I like to change roles and duties in my matches in preseason so that I can see what I what my team looks like. One of the most important things that people fail to understand is that the formation widget in your tactical screen when you create a tactic isn't the sum total of how your tactic plays. In fact, in reality, your tactic always looks a lot more different than what is seen on that screen. And for SI to actually create a screen that is um, accurate, it's going to be really hard because PPMs, PIs play a big part. And the best way for you to know how your tactic plays out in the game if something is going wrong is to use the with ball screen. Here you can see in the first half when we had a wing back on attack. Notice where my wing back is. There's a lot of space that is vacant. It's a very dangerous way for us to attack. It's very lopsided as well. So when we made the change, after we made the change, we had a very much more balanced system attacking. And when we didn't expose our right flank, we looked a lot more solid as a team going up and we also looked a lot more solid as a team coming down. So whenever you find yourself on a losing streak, learn how to use the tools that are already in the game so that they can help give you that extra edge. When you are on a losing streak, you want to learn how to become the master of closing out matches using mentality and duty changes as you saw in the match that I just played or rather highlights of the match I played. Uh, you can also do things like role changes and shape changes. Now, shape changes, don't forget, you know, if you want to drop every back, body back into defense, you sh don't, don't be shy about using fluid or very fluid shapes. Now, if you use structured shapes, then you have to expect there are going to be some of your players who are not going to be so quick to come back. And uh, on fluid shapes, they're going to be a bit more compressed when they're coming back. But these are things that you want to try on preseason to see how your team actually gels. You know, when they're doing these kind of things. You don't want to try them out in matches. So use preseason and try these things out. Because most of the time when I find people struggling, it's because they haven't tried things out. And then they go into matches and they, 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 they're desperately changing tactics just to close out matches when all you need to do is make a simple change here and there and then use the retain possession shout or the roam from position shouts in tandem with that. With If your team is good enough, then why not ball into box? Throw all three into in for good measure and keep the ball away from people because you got to remember there was a time not long ago uh, when teams used to do things like you know they pass the ball to the goalkeeper the goalkeeper passes back to the defender tick tock tick tock tick tock back to the goalkeeper goalkeeper picks up the ball again rolls it out again there was a time teams who were weaker they would do anything to keep the ball away from the opponent especially when the opponent was a much better opponent so these are things that you want to think about when you're on a losing streak how can you keep the ball away from the ai and use the ball more effectively because winning a point can be very very important when you're on a bad losing streak you got to become the master of that one nil scoreline or you got to become the master of the draw because when you are on a losing streak it's more important to win the point get out of the rut and sometimes people take things for granted like set pieces can be something that a lot of people take for granted now set pieces the default set pieces well some of them can do with a bit of work but every time you're defending a set piece corner or a set piece uh, free kick deep when you're attacking one make sure that you have some players staying back i've seen a lot of people concede goals from uh, attacking set piece routines furthermore if you ha have a set piece routine which uh, where you're defending then think about positioning some players with good first touch acceleration at the edge of the box, right? So when they get the ball, their first touch, they control the ball and they're off like a bullet and they run down with the ball and they've got a good first touch and they can dribble the ball and they get away and they get 
they give you a chance for scoring goals on the counter because there's so many, many strategies. And I use them in all my long-term saves. You, you can see, I'll probably do a set-piece guide very, very soon. I plan to do one, a set-piece guide, a real detailed set-piece guide because there's so many ways you can have fun with set-pieces. And uh, I hope that this video and the, the stuff that I've done on this show has been very helpful. Um, I've tried to keep things as succinct as possible so that all the information is in one video. Naturally, the other videos that I've done, they, they, you know, I drag on and on and I waffle and I talk about other stuff as well and I go into a lot more detail. Um, I hope that you found this video useful and if you have any questions, you know where to find me. You can always look me up. I'm addicted to F... See, I forgot where I come from. <laughs> if, you have, if you have any questions, you can always look me up on Twitter at BusterNet or addicted to FF.com, my website. Once again, I'd like to thank all my patrons for their continued support this channel. Your support has been fantastic. And I look forward to hearing from all of you very soon. Now, any questions, you know where to find me. So you guys have a good one. Take care. I hope this video's helped.